Hello and greetings from Pratt Institute in New York City from my colleagues, Mark Rosen, Irene Lopatowska, Laura Vroom and me, Leanne Bowler. We'd like to begin by acknowledging the teens and librarians from Brooklyn Public Library who participated with us on this research study. Their contributions are invaluable. I'd also like to acknowledge that this research was made possible with the support of the National Science Foundation. This paper presents research investigating youth data literacy at the public library. The project is framed by principles of participatory design and asks, how might an informal STEM learning environment such as the public library support the development of the skills, knowledge, and dispositions that young people need in order for them to take charge of their data lives, from data creation to data use, to be in short, data literate. So the problem of how to approach something as complex as data literacy in the voluntary drop-in setting of informal after-school sites of learning, like the public library, guides this study. In this presentation, we start with background information on the goals, perspectives, and theory that informs the study. Then we look at our findings vis-a-vis -vis how we engage teens in conversations about data to learn more about how, what they think data literacy programming at the library should look like. We present some examples, drawing upon our emergent inventory of data activities. And as we wrap up, we'll offer some final thoughts on working with teens to design data literacy activities at the library. The teens' preferences and recommendations are highlighted. So the goal of the study, the overarching goal, is to build a holistic, humanistic, and youth-oriented model of data literacy, which incorporates social awareness, critical approaches, and goodness of fit into STEM learning about data. While school-based learning around data addresses curricular needs, state standards, and academic pathways, it rarely includes the general public, let alone children and youth, in their out-of-school contexts. Little research has looked at the ways that young people would prefer to learn about data in the context of their everyday lives and within their communities, as opposed to their formal learning at school. How those preferences might translate into meaningful after-school STEM program for programming for teens at the library is a question that needs closer examination. First, a little bit of background. So what do we mean by data literacy? Uh, for us in this project, data literacy is much more than computation and statistics. We think data literacy, we think of it as a new liberal art that includes humanistic reasoning skills, socially sit situated practices, and ethical considerations, as well as a, as a set of dispositions uh, that facilitate the ability to critique data practices, to contextualize data to broader contexts, and to find meaning in data beyond stats and mathematics. Um, we argue that simply raising an interest in and, award, and an awareness of data is itself a noble goal and an important outcome of any youth data literacy program and that libraries shouldn't treat data literacy as an adjunct to mathematics or computer science. And the key question for libraries as sites of informal learning is how to meaningfully engage youth in data literacy within that particular environment. One of the first things a library should do when designing data literacy activities for teens is first define their terms of reference. What do they mean by data? In our project, we divided our work into two spheres of data, the first being personal digital data and the second civic or open data about cities and government. And note that this paper, this, pro this presentation focuses on a series of data labs with teens that looked at personal digital data which in the language of information science represents a new form of information called reflections of self. This is the digital representations of us and the ways that information systems react to these digital representations based on the data analytics of our digital footprint. And as we know, young people are growing up in a world of data valence and therefore understanding the underlying, underlying mechanisms of data and their consequences is an important life skill. An overarching um, 
perspective of this project is I mean, really coming from a youth rights perspective um, and basically trying to give um, youth the right to sovereignty over their own data, as well as the right to be data literate. And our perspective is that we should go first to youth and find out what would be the best way to learn about data. So here's a quick look at the methodology used in this project. Uh, we are we are applying um, participatory design methods because one way to respect young people's agency about their own data is to ask them to test and design the actual ways that they would like to learn about data. What would make it fun, meaningful, interesting, and worth their time in an after-school program? What, according to teens, might be the best ways for libraries to contribute to data literacy education? So our starting point was to frame this exploration from a participatory design perspective. There is no canonical definition of participation or co-design. And in fact, there are many models of participatory design. So our inspiration comes from three particular models highlighted here. One is, um, is Halskoff and Hansen's notion of a space for mutual learning. Another is Andrew Large's bonded design, which is a model for inter intergenerational design. And the third one is Lissa Soap's collegial pedagogy. So the notions of mutual learning, collegiality, and bonded design all transmit a clear sense of a dynamic relationship. And it's built upon a Lavin Wagner notion of a community of practice and of a Gottskian um, zone of proximal development. At this point, I'm going to briefly describe, describe the general structure of the, the uh, data labs. What we did was we ran a series of data labs with teens, two groups of teens. And um, this was the basic structure of them. And, um, and then in the next section, move on to the specific data activities. So to begin with, COVID-19 restrictions meant that the study had to be run entirely online. Um, the design sessions with teens uh, use platforms like Zoom, Google Jamboard, Google Documents, um, Kahoot, which is an online game um, environment where you make your own game, another game environment called Jeopardy Labs and various online videos and other games. There were two series of online design sessions. We called them data labs in this project. A series of six data labs during spring 21, followed by eight data, data labs in fall 21, with seven teens in each series for a total of 14 teens. We applied an iterative design model, one session leading to the next. We were always designing on the fly, um, like what to do next. It's based on um, input and recommendations and feedback um, coming from teens as they flowed through the, the various sessions. So it, it was an iterative design model rather than a series of one-shop workshops pre-designed by the researchers or the librarians. And the focus of these two series of data labs was on personal digital data, where teens and adults explored concepts like data flows, data identity, data rights, digital traces, privacy, algorithmic bias, and data representation, to, to name some of the concepts. Um, I will note that a later series of data labs, not discussed in this paper, um, focused on open data and civic data repositories and did so from a similar particip participatory design perspective. So here are some of our findings with regard to engaging teens in conversations about data, which is the topic of this paper. Um, so thinking about engaging teens in conversations. Um, from the beginning, we thought of the design process along a dynamic continuum. This allowed teens to engage with data in multiple ways. We found there is no one way to engage teens with data through design, and our experience really has confirmed this. So thinking of design as a collegial pedagogy means that design incorporates learning opportunities as well. In our practice, we saw four to five overlapping phases to, to design, each of which which offered opportunities for discourse about data, uh, for us, everybody to learn about data, for the teens to sharpen their understanding about data and to articulate um, more about how they thought teens should, should uh, engage with data at a public library. 
Thus, we saw many ways to engage teens in conversations about data through design. And as I said at the beginning of the, the sessions, there's, there were six to eight sessions. Um, we, at the beginning, we sort of uh, really introduced some of the principal concepts that I mentioned earlier, and there was learning activities throughout. We also had a phase, um, multiple phases, multiple sessions where teens tested data activities. We called it the try it outs. And uh, we had identified some data activities uh, that, that were online and they, they basically tried it out. And everything was followed with a lot of discussion and feedback um, and, and brainstorming and that sort of thing. Um, brainstorming played a very key role in um, the six to eight design lab sessions. And then at following, they did some building. We called it building. They were making their own plans for data literacy activities at the library. And in um, series two only, they were able to test one of their plans or designs with uh, a set of tweens, uh, people that were slightly younger than them. So to summarize, design offered many entry points for engaging teens in conversations about data. It was a really good platform for exploring um, data literacy activities. The data labs were multidimensional, presenting teens with diverse opportunities for discourse about data through guided learning, discovery and exploration, and creative hands-on expression. Uh, through it all, we were inventorying our activities since we had so many activities. We created an inventory. It's a preliminary taxonomy or typology of data activities, which we are still building, by the way, since we have two more series of data labs to investigate. We tried out many activities with the teens and they designed their own activities. And to varying degrees, each activity became a platform for conversations about data. From what we learned uh, about what teens... From what we did, we learned what teens like, what makes sense to them, and what is meaningful. The inventory of data literacy activities is organized by method or modality of activity, and then how the method was then applied or connected to data literacy. In this slide, we have loosely grouped the activities further into broader fields, as you can see here, interacting, problem solving, making, um, generating ideas, reflecting, and viewing. So I guess going from highly interactive to more sort of passive viewing um, and more kind of direct instruction. And you could see there was very little of the direct instruction, um, which we felt that sometimes was essential because at sometimes they had no understanding of what we even meant by data. So, uh, but, but generally they were quite um, active, um, interactive activities. So let's look at a few examples of the data activities implemented and tr tried out in the uh, data labs. One of the key tools and activities was uh, basically simple conversation, which was often launched with a question or a verbal prompt. We note in the paper, if you go and read the paper, that we usually had two conversations running in Zoom, one verbal and the other in chat. The chat conversation was really a lot more lively than the verbal discussion. We speculate that chat created a back channel for the teens and was the least school-like of the two modalities of interaction. And these chat conversations were really crucial. The back and forth led to talk about interests and sometimes inside jokes, a lot of camaraderie, which led to more participation and engagement. And this engagement in turn led to critical feedback about how to redesign or improve activities as instances of co-design. For our brainstorming sessions, we primarily use Google Jamboard, but Miro would have been a good option too. Here you can see teens thinking about what other teens, what they think other teens should know about data. Sometimes we layered the brainstorming. For example, we might start with uh, by asking teens to think of their favorite things, sports, hobbies, music, books, a sort of mini brainstorming of what they liked, what's interesting to them. And then collectively, we move to a second layer of brainstorming, brainstorming ideas to bring a data perspective to these interests. Like for instance, if they identified sports and uh, different kinds of sports, we would talk about, so what's Where's the data in that and how could we, uh, you know, 
uh, turn that into a library activity. And, you know, there's a lot of sports stats that are fun to play with. Here we see a creative storytelling activity. This activity, which is inspired by work with youth at the Five Rights Foundation, is designed to explore the theme of algorithmic assumptions and bias through data. First, the teens added what we call data points to each category. You see there's five categories, favorite anime, hobbies, movies, books, fave, celebrities. So they added data points to each category and they're, they're supposed to represent something of themselves here. Um, each person was supposed to put up at least one sticky note or post-it note. Um, this was to build an aggregated database of personal interest. But what, can a story, what kind of a story can be told through this data? That's, that's what we were trying to get at, um, how data can tell stories about people. And in the next step, the teens each picked one sticky note from each category and added it to the whiteboard. So collectively, the group built a persona telling stories about a person based on the, I guess, hints suggested by the data points. Then to wrap up, we asked why they made the, their assumptions and what assumptions could be faulty. For example, why were they assuming that this is a male? Why were they assuming that, that this person, the persona, like gory, dark stories? If we were an algorithm, what flawed assumptions would we be making? So it sort of made um, uh, algorithmic bias um, maybe more concrete and maybe hopefully a little fun to explore. So another thing we did was we played um, online games and went into game building environments. For example, Kahoot, um, which a lot of teachers use in their classrooms during COVID. Um, so we used it here in this after school library activity. So the idea of the gamification of data activities was a really popular theme. We showed teens some online games centered on data and then later a group of teens actually developed questions for a Kahoot game that they thought could be used in an online after school data literacy program at the library. We did have some videos, demonstrations, and what we call mini lectures. They were tiny, tiny little um, slides, slide decks or PowerPoints um, on just, for in instance, we had one presentation just showing them um, what data literacy activities, real ones had looked like in real libraries. We just talked about that just to give them a sense of what, what had been happening prior. So to understand basic data concepts, we inserted some direct instruction and demos to learn about data. Although we found quite a lot of web-based resources about data topics, most were not really suitable for a youth audience. Nevertheless, we did locate a small selection of short videos. However, watching them within a Zoom room was problematic for teens with slower internet connections. And um, we were very conscious that we were really trying not to get hooked on showing videos and doing lectures. Um, the, the, the notion was that there were some basic concepts that we just needed to get over that hurdle of understanding some basic concepts. Um, but we watched very carefully that we didn't get too in, enraptured with these things, these videos. And things. We also aim for some hands-on experiences with data using a variety of platforms. Uh, we use Google Sheets, which is like Excel and Voyant, which is a data vis visualization tool. Voyant shows how online text can be analyzed and interpreted. And we did this and we drew parallels to social media and other content that teens might contribute to the internet to show how their content can actually, you know, there can actually be text analysis of their content and what that actually is saying about them. So what did the teens like the most? Now we had several um, interviews like uh, focus group interviews. And then we also surveyed uh, the teens in the spring 21 labs. We surveyed them midway through the data labs and we had an online survey at the end of the fall 21 series. So here you see results from the fall 21 series which pretty much mirror other things that they've said. And you could see that their favorite activities were the ones that were social, interacting, um, you know, and basically um, creative, um, interactive. The, their favorite activities were those that allowed for high interaction, high communication, and lots of creativity. 
so we you know we we um, learned a little bit more uh, about what works in an after school data literacy activity for teens thanks to the teens um, wonderful participation in the data labs and to to summarize they elaborated on interactivity connectivity stressing the importance of friendship fun unstructured play and a competitive element so they did look for some competition uh, it was not a surprise teens do not want data literacy activities at the library to look like school so they they drew a sharp line between school learning and library learning they really did um, so a couple of things they pointed out is that um, librarians if they were to initiate data literacy activities they should draw from activities that teens already enjoy such as playing online games with friends um, they should incorporate competition um, definitely make it somewhat social so they can be with friends and meet new people their age and basically keep it fun and not too structured so um, this if you combine with the the kinds of activities that they uh, they thought they they said that they liked uh, provide some pointer towards what librarians can do when developing data literacy activities further thoughts and um, on on data literacy we've been learning a little bit more about um, where how does critical data literacy emerge in in teens as they learn a little bit more and take a deep dive into data literacy we see that it's slow to emerge and it has to be nurtured so throughout the design process it was emergent it wasn't uh, apparent right at the beginning and it it really emerged when things became personally relevant and more hands-on as one young teen said, and we quoted him earlier, um, you know, this came late in the data labs. Um, this teen, age 14, said, it's crazy how everything can be data, like even from the moment you were born. So this, you know, he didn't express this at the beginning, but it kind of emerged as, as we were working through the uh, six to eight weeks. In terms of engagement with data, it's important to schedule time for social play and creativity um really to structure it around making is is the best um strategy using narrative and storytelling is valuable and again to emphasize that the teens love games and competitive games especially uh, when they were designing their own data activities they they really went for games they one group designed dataopoly which is like monopoly another did kahoot uh, or jeopardy quizzes um and that, that sort of thing so then in terms of the context of co-design, we realize that it really matters. So there's contextual aspect to what we did. Um, it was uh, obviously online, so that's that's one important thing, but it we were dealing with a specific disciplinary or content knowledge of data. Um, so we weren't really dealing with craft knowledge or even technical knowledge in, in the context of these data labs. And obviously, the shape of a data literacy program would change based on how much disciplinary, technical, or craft knowledge you want to implement. And the type of data matters. So in these two series, we really delved into personal digital data from really uh, bringing in sociocultural considerations. But in latter data labs, we brought in um, civic data. And then there's research data. We haven't touched on that in our, our research yet. Uh, one thing to consider with participatory design is that what we saw was that there, you as the uh, participant um, have to go in with a sense of fluidity, that there are can be many forms of participation within a single project. Uh, teens can be more active participants and then they can back away. A project can begin with adults doing the heavy lifting in terms of conceptualizing the overall project and then teens can move in. Um, and towards greater autonomy and really take charge. So to go in and think that it's all teens doing something all the time um, is not necessarily um, the way it really works in real life. Although to look at the final point on conscious co-design, um, we in our project were very conscious of um, our role, our researchers role in the co-design. And every step of the way we were questioning ourselves, trying to raise our own self-awareness about um, how uh, you know 
we were negotiating participation with the teens. So with that, I thank you. And if you want more information about the project, please visit our website.